him to interview me for the snapshot. And we got talking. And after about one hour, we realized there was an interview that had to be done, right? So I'm excited to listen to his paper. And frankly, I was a little, not worried. I'm, I'm happy he's talking about meritinatal inflation. Um, but I didn't know how the campus would take it, honestly. <laughs> Especially with that picture on the flyer. <laughs> but um, looks like we're all set. This is good, audience. So. Awesome. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out on such a busy week. I understand this is midterms for mostly everybody, so the fact that you were able to find this time is impressive. Also, a big thank you to Reshmi for making this possible. The Brown Bank Lecture Series is something that goes on monthly throughout the semesters. So this has been going on for about a year now. Uh, this creates uh, a forum for people to come together over lunch is the idea, even though I see none of you brought brown bags, but you know, <laughs> to come together over lunch and talk about stuff that typically gets swept under the carpet in our society, which is really cool. Um, uh, so this is a topic that I've been really interested in for three years now. I've been considering it my undergraduate thesis project, um, which means that it's been something I've been continuously getting back out, revising, um, and now I'm like completely rewriting it because eventually I'll get it published, I promise. So, uh, yeah, that's my credentials, I guess. I've just been doing a lot of research. And why did I choose this? That's, that's usually the question I get asked. Why did I choose it? Uh, I chose this question, uh, I chose to really s dig into this subject because it's something that I don't know anyone who knows a lot about it, right? So it was one thing that I was like, ah, I could be an expert in something that other people aren't. So, and also because I wanted to be right in a disagreement I had three years ago when I initially <laughs> started doing research. I wanted to be right, and I convinced the other person of finally, at uh, the point that I was presenting this at the Pacific University Undergraduate Conference last spring, uh, she was like, by the way, I, would, I will never circumcise my son if I have one. But um, that, that's a good lead into a disclaimer I want to make is I am not here to uh, demonize or make you feel bad. Anyone who has been circumcised, who has circumcised their sons, um, or even if they plan on doing it currently, uh, that's, I mean, if, if you plan on doing it, then you're just like everybody else. It's not a problem um, until you know what we're going to talk about. Is after you know the facts, then I think you probably should be swayed. But even if you're not, that's still going to hold it against you. But Patty um, here from the Arbiter, she actually, she and a team of the, with the Arbiter actually just did a survey across campus. I know you got uh, surveyed. And 80% of women on campus in this, it was 100 women, 100 people, right? 80% of women uh, said that they were pro-circumcision or that they would circumcise their sons or that they have. Uh, whereas uh, males, 77% of them, this was pretty close, you know? I'm guessing, like, just in general, that is the general sentiment in the United States. About 80% of people in the United States, from, from the stuff I've read, are in favor of it. Which, may, I mean, it may, makes sense, right? Because it just seems, I guess, like something that you ought to do. Uh, and I think a big reason for that is because doctors don't typically disclose all the facts which is one of the things that I'm arguing here, is that the, the information in this presentation needs to be made available. Uh, the final disclaimer, oh, no, that, that other disclaimer wasn't finished yet. Uh, if parents, I'm not trying to demonize parents, uh, and also religions. I'm not trying to call out religions that, are, that have been practicing this. You'll see later in the presentation that I actually argue that religions that have been practicing this practicing this for millennia, are justified. Um, it, or at least were justified. So we'll, we'll get to that. Then the final disclaimer is that this is not for the faint of heart, weak of stomach, or any other th such thing, because uh, I'm going to show a video here so that we are not all in theory and abstract and removed from the real world. I'm going to make sure that you guys are all very well aware that this is something that is real affects people and it, and, it, and it sucks. So if you want to step out for a couple minutes, maybe you did just eat lunch or maybe you don't want to have your lunch ruined in a little bit, 
I recommend the second one. And I'm not going to show the whole thing. It says it's eight minutes long. Uh, I'm just going to show about a minute. So, And uh, you're all lucky today because the sound doesn't work on the overhead. So it's all coming from the laptop, so you don't really have to hear this as loud as it would be otherwise. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm showing this is because uh, intactivists, which I guess I technically am, people who argue that babies should be left intact. Um, it's an argument for bodily integrity. Intactivists typically uh, say that most circumcisions in the United States are conducted without anesthetics. I don't know where they're getting those facts from. I can't say if that's true or not. The reason I'm using this video is because they do use anesthetics. Just listen to that baby and tell me if it really makes a difference. The pitch of the screen is what I'm pointing out here, and the fact that it it's felt. Okay. It'll be about 30 to 20 seconds. I promise you it gets worse. <laughs> I was in a really bad mood for about four hours uh, yesterday when I was trying to find the right video. Oh god. Which means I just had to watch a lot of videos, right? And as you can see, the anesthetic doesn't really make that much of a difference. So before moving on from this point, I'm basically going to outline what we're doing in the presentation. I'm going to talk about the foreskin's purpose. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about whatever this paper tells me. Yeah, the foreskin's purpose, followed by uh, a few interesting facts about this, uh, historical facts about the practice, how it arose in the United States. And then I'll, uh, we'll do a thing where we, we see what all the arguments in support of circumcision are. I will attempt to break them all down. And then uh, at the end of that, we will uh, we'll kind of just do a question and answer period. We'll be chill, and we'll just see uh, what questions might not have been addressed. So the foreskin serves a natural function. That's... The foreskin serves... You're actually perfect. You didn't really miss anything, so... Right. Actually, you missed the video that promised you to see it. <laughs> um, the foreskin serves a natural purpose. It works like a glove or a sheath to protect the glands penis, which is the tip. So um, anatomically speaking, the tip of the penis is the anatomical equivalent 
to a female's clitoris. So uh, in the same way that the clitoris needs a, uh, the, 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 cl the clitoral hood, yeah, in the same way that the hood is needed to keep it moist, sensitive, protected, uh, the foreskin is also needed to keep the glands penis moist, sensitive, and protected. If you remove the, uh, the foreskin, the glands dry out, necessarily, for life. Uh, sexual pleasure for the rest of your life is decreased by, they usually say 40 to 60%, depending on the study. Um, I'm willing to just say, let's just, just give it to, let's just say it only decreases it by 20%. That's still significant, I would argue. The other thing that the, the foreskin uh, does is it makes masturbating easier and it makes wet dreams more common. Wet dreams are when you get off in your sleep. So uh, if you don't have a foreskin, typically uh, a male without a foreskin will use lotion or something to masturbate, and some kind of a lubricant. Because the foreskin itself is self-lubricating to some degree. So the, the, the penis naturally is, to some degree, naturally lubricating. Uh, and that, that function is completely lost uh, through circumcision. Uh, an interesting factor, this is kind of speculative, not very. I like to point this out though. Um, teenagers are, are always a hotbed of hormones. They're just a, a pent up mixture of emotions and, and, and urges and stuff like that. And uh, teenage boys are a big problem. Uh, I was one, I was a problem. And uh, it, would, it just makes sense to think that if the, that teenage boy is not yet masturbating to relieve that tension that builds up, uh, it, it makes sense that the natural function of the foreskin then is to relieve that tension in your sleep. But what happens when 80% of the United States males are circumcised? They're walking around all pent up with this tension that they may or may not have realized how to relieve yet. And, I mean, even if they take it into their own hands, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> but even if they take it into their own hands, that's different than if it was just the, the, the pressure was relieved naturally in their sleep, unconsciously, without them having to think about it. Um, so, so that ties in directly to why and how circumcision arose in the United States. But before I talk about how it arose in the United States, I'll talk about the historical, the longer reaching prehistoric kind of context. Uh, People typically associate circumcision with Judaism and Islam. And that is because they're two of the religions that it is in their texts that it says that you are to do that. Um, it was considered a covenant with God. Uh, Abraham made a covenant with God that all of the children in Israel would be circumcised, or the males. But it's not, it's not uh, isolated to the, to, uh, to the Middle East. This also occurs um, in Africa and then I believe in other regions. I don't know too much about the other regions where it uh, arises. But uh, circumcision is practiced on infants, on, on teenagers, uh, and on males or females. Uh, and it depends on the culture. Some do both. Some, some do it in infancy. Some do it in, in, in teenage, teenagerhood. In, in preparation for adulthood, right? Um, and the reason I'm not going to be focusing on female genital mutilation is because it is something that I think we're all in agreement about already. Uh, I think that everyone already agrees that that's not right. Uh, and I, I would argue that it's worse um, than male genital mutilation. But uh, the two, we were just talking about how the two still have a lot of arguments in common for why to circumcise. So, um, in a lot of cultures that do conduct uh, circumcisions for, on, on whoever at whatever age, there are the, some of the common arguments are always relate to hygiene, um, aesthetics, and uh, purity. So, and that's going to be a common theme here. But I want to make a, a point. This is the point where I, I kind of say, okay, I'm going to give it to your religion. You were right. Uh, or at least you were wise. 
in the case of Judaism and Islam, uh, these are desert regions. Uh, water was a scarce resource, so therefore it makes sense that the main maintenance of keeping uh, yourself clean would be a lot, a lot harder. The upkeep would be costly because water was gold. So it, uh, they had to, pretty much their hands were forced. I wonder if you drop a little puns all throughout this. So I mean, so so how and when did circumcision raise its ugly head in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly, and this uh, surprised me, and it usually surprises other people. It didn't just come here, and, and it hasn't just been a part of our culture forever. I mean, it, is, it doesn't really make sense that it would, because we typically had access to clean water um, around here. Uh, and, and Christianity doesn't require it, so this being a predominantly Christian nation, uh, uh, usually people assume that we, that Christians just kind of inherited it from Judaism because they inherited the religion from Judaism, kind of, sort of, no offense to me, but um, it's true. That's not true, though. That's not how it occurred. Actually, it was brought into the U.S. for medical reasons. So, uh, David Golaher in his book, Circumcision, the Most Controversial uh, Surgery. I believe that's the name of it. I don't want to look. Anyway, he, he's, he uses excerpts from old medical journals to illustrate and show the, the origins of uh, how circumcision arose in the US. And it was basically in the 1800s. So uh, this is still very Puritan, very uh, Victor uh, Victorian kind of mindset, uh, which was that you know, they believe that sex is, is really, really, really bad. So, uh, masturbation is considered self-abuse. Uh, even wet dreams, even though you're not responsible for wet dreams, you were still, it was still something where you have to go to a confessional afterwards. Uh, so it was a sin. And uh, I, this is, the, the thing is, is like people back then believed, or at least they said to their children that, uh, sexual impurity caused a, a host of severe maladies. So, for instance, um, I'm a parent in the 1800s, and there's some there's some poor child who's paralyzed, and, and and you say you tell your kid he's paralyzed because he was playing with himself, you know, or or oh yeah oh yeah, have you heard that masturbation causes blindness or furry palms or uh, mental retardation or uh, there's a bunch of other ones. And, 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 and basically, that was because they equated everything to that. So um, some brilliant doctor was like, wow, so, so, so these kids playing with themselves or having wet dreams is causing all of these problems. Why not just cut it out? You know, nip it in the bud, so to speak, or uh, <laughs> ahead of time, in infancy, you know. And, and so that's why, I think, that was yours actually, wasn't it? That's where I got that from. I think so. Anyways. <laughs> so... So the doctor was like, just cut it off. Right, exactly. Thank you. Um, and supposedly it worked. So supposedly it cured some uh, paralyzed person. They, uh, <laughs> they just, yeah, this, there's a teenage boy in one of these uh, studies who they, they circumcised him and he just snapped right out of his paralysis. So they were like, hey, oh, it works. And then it became really, really widespread. And then um, I'm, I'm, I think Christians kind of just assumed, my parents did, Oh, well, obviously that's why they were doing it in the Old Testament as well. So it is something that's smart to do. Um, but, you know, obviously the Apostle Paul and St. Peter in the New Testament both say it's not necessary for Gentiles, non-Jews, to do this. It's, it's specifically a relational thing between Jews and God. Not for Gentiles. So why are we still doing it? That's my question. I really don't know why we're still doing it. I mean, the I guess the go-to answers are uh, just that it's kind of a, a cultural habit at this point. It's just something that we're used to. The medical reasoning, you know, the, the ones that I just illustrated, those haven't been being used for about 150 years. Uh, medical reasons only started resurfacing after circumcision was being called into scrutiny, like 
uh, within the last hundred years, the medical industry has been trying to find good reasons, like justifications for circumcision. So now you will typically hear a few reasons that are supposed to be medical, they're questionable. We'll talk about those in a minute. So I thought it would be fun to, hopefully that turns off. I thought it would if I did that. Oh, it's because this is still plugged in. I think you have to turn off. I'm always curious about why we're still circumcising. Uh, as I just said, we're not using the same reasons we used to. No one really believes that masturbation is quite the taboo that we used to. So why are we still doing it? I would like to crowdsource and get all the reasons that you can possibly think of or that you've ever heard for why this is done. So we'll just do this by, you can just say it or you can raise your hand. Or, what's going um, on? I would say Desire for your children to fit in. Locker rooms. Locker rooms. Yeah. It's custom. Customary at this point. Right, and you can see how the aesthetics and the locker room syndrome are both kind of predicated upon the cultural, it's what we do, it's mm -hmm. customary. There's gotta be better ones than this. Um, the one I recently heard I told you was health benefits told by the doctor. I don't know if he did like ec outside research, but he said his doctor specifically told him so. Uh, dude, I can't ruin it. <laughs> Any other arguments in favor of circumcision? It used to be believed that urinary tract infections were caused by non-circumcision. So. I'll just put an extra mark beside it. That kind of fits under that. We'll delve into what the possible medical benefits are in a minute. The biggest one, I think, uh, also one of the most convincing ones uh, is hygiene. You gotta give it to people. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. It is pretty low maintenance. Uh, religion. Any others? Here, how about this? How about this one? I want our son to look like daddy. We wouldn't want our son having something daddy doesn't have. So I'll call it the wanna look like daddy argument. <laughs> I'm sure that kid is just dying to look like daddy. <laughs> uh, I'm not meaning to mock or deride fathers who literally have chosen to circumcise their sons because of that reason alone. Uh, Dr. Jason J. Campbell was uh, just here last week and he said that was his reasoning. Uh, and then he, at, in our conversation about it, he was like, yeah, that was before I got into critical thinking and philosophy <laughs> and really weighing arguments and really second guessing why we do such things. And he's all, I just wasn't really thinking about it at the time. It just seemed like the right thing to do. And I was like, well, fair enough. You're, you're one of billions you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a cha in a millennia that has been doing this. So it's not that big of a deal that you did it. I think that's the, the majority of the arguments here. Oh, a good one. This is actually a lot of males, I think, make up their decision based on this. It's what their mate wants. So uh, I'll just call it mate preferences, right? The idea being that uh, this is what uh, sexual partners want, which I would say are still under the umbrella of aesthetics, which is also under the umbrella of just what is customary in our culture. How about masculinity? Is that something that, I mean, I, I really don't. 
Yes. I, I, I even knew about this three years ago when my son was born. And uh, I think uh, when the doctor came in to ask, or the nurses came in to ask, the first question was, what is my religion? Mm. Um, and I asked, what are the pros and cons? Of course, I would do it, but just, just I had no idea that this is even a practice in right. the country. Um, but I think that's the built in of a religion in my situation and, and, and culture because this really being right. uh, you know, an oddly part, I guess I could also call it a culture. Right. Um, but um, masculinity, and I did some reading after that, and, um, I, and I think this goes under the garb of this is what my mate wants, you know, because you know we live in a heteronormative society. It's always easy to give up a woman, that's what she wants. I'm sure she doesn't. It's masculine to him and just show that which goes to the locker room syndrome. Right. Like you can see how these ones are all so tightly knit together. If you simply pull what is customary out from it, the rest all fall apart. So these are all culturally predicated. Um, religion kind of predicates culture, though, so you can kind of see how that's kind of connected. The thing is, is the religions that practice it are still... Uh, not necessarily the majority of their uh, practicing uh, adherents, they don't necessarily have access to clean water still. That's still the, the case. So um, uh, I, call, I was calling this a human rights violation up until last week when uh, Jacob Morris called me on, on it. He was like, well, if it's a human rights violation in the US, then it's a human rights violation everywhere. And I said, no, because everything's contextual. Uh, you know, I, I would want to be circumcised if I lived somewhere where I didn't have access to clean water. It's a fact. Uh, and that's because, in, in case you didn't know, here's a disgusting fact. Uh, it's not disgusting, it's natural, but uh, it grosses some people out, so that was my warning. It's just that something called smegma builds up inside the foreskin if you're not maintaining, cleaning uh, that area. And it's essentially like... Uh, sleep in your eye, in the corner of your eye. You wake up in the morning, you gotta get that little bit of sleep out there. That's because uh, the eyelid is serving the same purpose as the foreskin, basically, right? The eyelid is keeping your eyeball moist, foreskin's keeping the glands moist, both have a little bit of buildup, both need to be cleaned. Fun facts. Uh, and then these are the two arguments that I'm going to take very seriously because I think they are the major contenders. Uh, religion. I will get this one out of the way right now by saying I'm not a professional theologian and I don't claim any of the religions that say that this is something to be done. But there are professional theologians in Catholicism, even though they don't all practice it. Uh, there are uh, Catholic theologians, Muslim theologians, and there are Jewish theologians, all of them uh, saying that this needs to be reformed within their religions. And they give... Uh, they, they kind of use the contextual argument. They say, well, of course God had this, this covenant with you when you didn't have access to clean water. It made sense. God wanted you to be clean, blah, blah, blah. But, but now we live here and stuff's different. And I don't really know how sophisticated their arguments are because I've not really delved into it. But if you are practicing adhering to one of, one of the religions that does uh, push this, uh, I, would, I would look into that. Uh, and also, I mean, I could always, yeah, I'll do it. There's also the colorblind cult uh, thought experiment. If there was a cult of believers who believed that uh, taking their infants and poking a needle into their eye and making them uh, colorblind for life was a good thing uh, because, for instance, maybe their religion thought that this was a fallen world and we shouldn't get caught up by all the color and glamour of it and we should be have our sights fixed on heaven. It sounds like something that could actually be practiced, but I don't think it is. But you know, if, if that was still being practiced, I think that we would respect the fact that they believe this, but we would still have to talk about whether or not that's something that should be promoted by our doctors in our hospitals, right? Cool, so um, I'll just go through these really fast so that we can get to the question and answer period. Uh, aesthetics, as we said, it's cultural. Uh, cultural, just because we've been doing it without any real good reasons lately. Um, locker room syndrome is the same thing, but this is more realistic. Uh, there were boys growing up, uh, I mean, there are right now probably, boys in locker rooms getting laughed at or made fun of or shunned somehow because they look different. That's real. But 
as these things change in different regions, uh, it goes both ways. Um, you could be the odd duck uh, because you got cut. So, I mean, that's still something that happens. Uh, the one I look like daddy one, I don't think we really need to address it. Uh, what the mate wants. There's a really good video that I shared on the Facebook event for this. Um, I think it's called Adam Ruins Everything or something like that. And it's this guy, uh, for his YouTube channel, he chooses circumcision as a topic. And he, he addresses this argument by uh, having a bunch of women in chairs in front of... Uh, you know, this, this easel, and he's got a blanket over the, or, or a, a drape over the easel, and he, he drops it, and he says, what, is, what do y'all feel about this? And it's, it's, a, it's a, a circumcised penis, and, and, and they're all just like, ugh. They're like, they're like well, you, you like it? And they're like, it's, it's, it's a penis, it's weird, you know? And then he's like, oh, okay, and then he moves it, and then it's, it's an uncircumcised one, and, and, and then he's like, how about this one? And they're like, it's still a penis. And the <laughs> point, point being is, like, penises aren't just something that people, like, want to... I have not seen any really great art of penises like I mean, I'm sure it exists, but only because it's a novelty, right? No one's like really getting turned on by that, I don't think. So, I mean, that, I mean obviously there's outliers. So, uh, and then masculinity. Men are, are very, they typically identify themselves with their penises for some reason. They're all about their penises. And uh, for some reason, some of them think their masculinity is harmed. Well, no, see, this is the thing. I am circumcised. I love my penis. <laughs> Therefore, my masculinity is all tied up in that fact that I am circumcised. It doesn't really make sense. You'd still love it if you weren't. In fact, you'd be bigger. Hey. <laughs> cool. So I think we can get rid of all these ones. Yeah, we have about, I think we should take the question. Cool. I'll just finish off these ones by saying hygiene, fixed by water, the health benefits, it's very likely that it can reduce the spread of HPV to some degree. But three out of five people have HPV already in a country where 80% of the males are circumcised. I say it's probably not much of a difference. There's also studies that try to say that it lowers the spread of HIV. Um, if it does, it's pretty insignificant, seeing as in Europe, uh, the, the circumcision rate is between 5 and 20%. And, in, and then the, the spread of STDs in Europe is also a lot lower. So um, the, all the studies that I've seen about uh, HIV, uh, STD reduction, or the spread of reduction, uh, I've never seen them mention the fact about Europe. So thank you. They're erect. So I think that you can't really, really notice the toilets. Am I right? I don't, I don't know. Don't you think? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm right. I was gonna, I was gonna look at everybody, but <laughs> Eric is saying yes. So uh, th th they basically look the same when they're erect. It's actually it interesting. Matter. It's, oh yeah. It's not gonna be any different. Right. I just was curious. Yeah. It is interesting. The, the Greeks actually didn't practice it, and, and they thought that a man was only truly naked when the foreskin was retracted. Like, if you could see the glands, then they were naked. So they were like, why would you cut that off? <laughs> and you're always <laughs> naked, you can't walk around like, it was like a permanent pair of shorts. You know? <laughs> <laughs>
Um, the idea of, um, you know, circumcision, male genital circumcision, was often also used to emasculate the other. And there's a word for it. It's a very derogatory word. That, you know, it's like the N word that's used for the other, the Arabs, um, and, you know, Muslims in the other part of the world. So um, I think that runs that risk. That, that's, that's, that's something very risky to even develop as an agrarianist. It is very Eurocentric. It's sure. just another way of saying, oh, you know, those others. All the more reason to civilize them or to. So even though it's true in Islam, there, I mean, I, I know many who have been circumcised. Again, they garb it under religion, but it's more of a cultural, customary thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that um, argument for why that's pretty um, is passe and it's pretty controversial in, in history. Yeah, it's definitely. From your research point of view, that helps, you know, I mean, because yeah, you're trying sure. to publish them. I'm hoping you go to grad school and, you know, if you yeah. do want to. It's something definitely something I try to tiptoe around. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I don't so. think I do it very well, but yeah. I'm working on it. I, I keep trying different ways of yeah. dealing with the older reasons. Right, right. right. I, I, not to get too much on it, but I personally disagree that it seems like an argument for colonialization for two reasons. One is because that argument is predicated on the fact that it's a geographical thing, wherefore bringing whiteness and Christianity or whatever over there doesn't change the fact that it's still a desert. Well, no, but that, that doesn't mean that you know there are not clean people. They don't. I mean, okay. So after. Oh yeah, no, no. If, you, if that's the that's thing what that, I'm getting. Okay, uh, that's exactly what I'm getting. At. They're not clean. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, I, of I agree. course, of course. I mean, if you read it historically, and that's very Eurocentric, that's very offensive to the other side of the world. It's still used, okay. you know. It's still mm -hmm. used. So, um, again, I mean, you know, we talk about customers. We are talking about culture, female circumcision. Um, and you said we all agree, right? It's not. Um, it's just a fact, you know. I'll just know. Right. There are like more than half population of the world who would just think something different, and they would justify it with the same reason that the United States is justifying it. Exactly. Right. So we, we have, have to be very cautious yeah. about that thing. They're not in our, you know, uh, zeal to justify. They're not basically cutting out the other side and seeing the other. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Okay. So. Um, I guess I'll just start with one question. Well, I was wondering what you were talking about in terms of um, like preteen and teenage boys and like something about them being removed in their sleep. You, I don't, I, I maybe I lost part of it, but okay. I didn't see the connect there. Okay. If you could explain that. So the foreskin is almost like. What is that sex toy called? Is that a flashlight? Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a natural flashlight. Meaning that if the penis went erect in sleep, right, and then the person was just kind of grinding a little bit, the flashlight's already there. No hands on needed, right? So um, nature had a way of relieving that tension. Okay. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. And then you have. I had a couple questions. I was curious, number one, if you think very economic arguments about Medicaid. I know Idaho Medicaid changed in the last few years. They, they don't pay for circumcisions anymore, and that's obviously going to have an impact on the number of people who have circumcisions, because it's an economic decision more than anything. Uh, if that, you think, is going to have impact over time, and what this landscape looks like, regardless of parental preferences. I was also curious where you get, where the numbers come from in terms of sexual pleasure, because how do you compare somebody if somebody's been circumcised since birth, how are they going to know how it would be different or compare it with somebody who hasn't been? Right, that's a good question. Um, it is the... Uh, so the Royal Austra Australasian College of Physicians officially stated in 2010, Ethical and human rights concerns have been raised regarding elective infant male circumcision because it is recognized that the foreskin has a functional role. Foreskin, the foreskin has two, uh, two main functions. Firstly, it exists to protect the glands penis. Secondly, the foreskin is a primary sensory part of the penis, containing some of the most sensitive areas of, of the penis. This is why it's an approximation. Uh, we don't really know. That's why I said, let's just say it's 20% instead of the 40 to 60 that is commonly cited. 
Um, that, and that's just to be super safe. But uh, the idea is uh, between that study and another study at the Seoul, Seoul University in 2007, the Seoul National University in 2007 did a study on over 300 adult males. Uh, and, and these people rated the difference after they were healed after the circumcision. 63% uh, uh, reported masturbatory difficulties, uh, and the rest, uh, and all of them, like uh, talked about a decrease in pleasure. And, and so it's kind of has to be estimated, older. right? And they assessed it on both sides. It was when they were older, yeah. Um, so that kind of touches upon your question. So, like in terms of doctors now trying to find adequate reasons to like continue the practice i would be curious as to how much money circumcision like infant circumcision generates for right. hospitals yeah. and insurance companies or whatever i don't know how it would cover but what are the economic benefits of male circumcision and do you think that's an influencing factor for yeah. doctors who try to seek health benefits now i can't provide you a source for this um but it is said that circumcision is the most prevalent surgery in the United States. Uh, if, and, and, and it might just be most prevalent cosmetic surgery. I mean, that might be true. Either way, uh, it, it's happening every few minutes, in the, probably more often than every few minutes in the country right now, right? And if you multiply the millions of babies per year uh, against the average cost <coughs> of a circumcision, which is between 100 and 300 dollars, yeah, that's a cash cow. They sell it for a piece. A what? They sell it. They sell it for a piece. Uh, that's that's what they sell. Oh, okay. the cut piece. Yeah, that. Oh, they sell so they, it. They as sell. Well. It. Yeah, and it gets it gets added into some cosmetics cream for removing like wrinkles. Yeah, don't don't buy that. Just, yeah. just wear your wrinkles with pride. I say. You know? <laughs> oh, <laughs> cosmetics. <laughs> <laughs> or you're wearing your really wrinkles. wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the most sensitive, yeah. So some of the most sensitive parts are hormones. But yeah, you're right. We don't really know very much about it. Yeah. Uh, and and then I mean, there are personal testimonies about. Uh, I've talked to males uh, through the internet. So I mean, this is take it or leave it. But I've talked to. Uh, I interviewed a, a bunch of males who they'll do YouTube videos about. Oh, I'm trying to restore my foreskin because, oh, I, you know, I, I want it back and I'm not. Uh, Tom Rudd is one of them. He, he was in London. I, I interviewed him via Skype. Uh, I think that's in the paper. But th there's uh, males who have had it done in adulthood uh, by choice or because of medical emergencies. I've talked to a few of them, and like they said, the difference is like going from seeing in color to, to like seeing in black and white sexually. Um, and here's the interesting. Th this is an argument that. You hear it and you kind of think, oh, that's messed up. That's a messed up argument. But then the more I thought about it, I was like, okay, I can see how people can get behind this argument. The argument goes like this. Why would a male need more pleasure? I mean, they're always turned on. That's all they care about. That's all they think about. Why do they need more pleasure? Actually, yeah, I, I would agree that I wouldn't mind not being as consumed. But the thing is, according to these personal testimonies, the difference is the difference of being circumcised is part of what causes the, the stereotypical um, kind of patterns that you see with males uh, sexually. The, so, so they say that it's like the, the, the sexual experience, the foreplay and all of that leading up to the orgasm is more fluid and more, you know, you're kind of riding it like this, whereas afterwards it's kind of like just, so, you know, this is, not something that obviously I have medical studies for, but it's from personal testimonies. Well, I mean, I would also say to that, like, you know, the people sitting there saying, why do men need more pleasure? It's like, why is it your place to decide if they yeah. need more pleasure or not? So, 
I'm sorry, we have to stop there because we have something else going on in 10 minutes. Okay. But um, thank you so much. Um, on a personal note, I think this is unique, um, what you're doing research-wise. I wish you all the best. Keep developing this. And um, we have a long road to go, but this is, and it, it, it contributes to sexuality studies, you know, and, and then, uh, so um, thank you very much for sharing your research with us once again. And thank you, you all, for coming. And um, if any one of you would like to share your research on this platform, please contact me, I'll be happy to host you. Gender studies is an interdisciplinary uh, program, and you don't have to say gender thousand times in your paper to come and speak over here. It really isn't necessary. So come share your research with us, and um, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you again.